And welcome to another edition of Orlando Magic Pod Squad. And we are beyond excited to catch up with a good friend, Greg Kite, former Magic player. Of course, 12 NBA seasons from 1983 to 1995. Four of those right here in City Beautiful from 1990 to 1994. And, and Greg, I got to start with this, right? The Magic had opening night, season 34 for the Orlando Magic. You started in 1990. Does it seem like it was yesterday? Does it seem like... Forever ago? I mean, how fast does time fly? For you? Oh, absolutely. Time goes by so quick. And uh, you love those days in the NBA. And it's going, boy, you wish your uh, your body could still do it forever. But uh, I, and I get excited even now when the season starts. It's 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 that it's that uh, body clock that we have. Hey, it's basketball time. So it was great to see the Magic play last night. And, and they're, getting, they're looking very competitive. Greg, are you one? And now some guys, when they retire, they don't they don't watch anymore. Or you're you're still one of the guys that when the season starts, you're you're amped up and ready to go. Yeah, I I, I love watching games. I watch as much as I can. Um, you know, oftentimes it's my 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 problem is I stay up too late watching the, the West Coast games. Watch a lot of college games, so I, I keep up with the game a lot. I still stay involved. I help with uh, as an assistant to a coach for a high school varsity team and a private school here in town and, and so I stay involved with the game in one way or another so never gets out of your blood so Greg since you watch you watched last night uh, you know the magic opening night against Detroit with our young team you know give us your thoughts on this young magic team what do you think well I think JT they're finally catching up you and I used to run occasional four or five pick and roll you know, yeah. and, and uh, yeah. they just didn't run a steady diet of it. Now they got these six, ten, seven foot guys. So I, <laughs> I really like what uh, uh, Weltman and Hammond had put together, and, and uh, you know they've got some a lot of talent, uh, athletic talent, a lot of length, and uh, excited to see uh, you know uh, the great job. I think Wendell Carter was very solid last year. Got a good group of uh, you know pretty deep guards here with injuries. They've got. Uh, you know, some good depth, but uh, you got to love Paulo Bancaro and and, uh, and 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 Franz Wagner and, and uh, Mo Wagner and, and and if the other guys, you know, the other guys are contributing, good role players. So the thing I saw last night and the thing I've seen here a little bit in preseason, I think the Magic have really kind of lacked a little bit of a, a number one and a number two scoring punch, and that may be developing. You know, every good team kind of has those – two guys that's 18, 20, 22 points from those guys. So that's going to, that's going to make a difference, you know, cause you know how it goes down the stretch. You need that guy who can, who can, who can create his own shot. If, if the flow doesn't get it. Greg, how about Paulo? Give us your thoughts on Paulo. We're, we're blown away with him. And then of course the dunk last night. I mean, did that bring you out of yeah. your chair like it did for us? That, that did. Yeah. First of all, the dunk that reminded me of my, my, uh, inaugural game as a rookie in Cleveland <laughs> with the Celtics and uh I, I, I my dunk unfortunately it was in it was during warm-ups and the ball boy didn't want to take a charge he, he was scared so no <laughs> I could dunk but never like Paulo did he was he was something you know the great thing about him that I see when well, he's got a great feel for the game seems like a great kid very you know good basketball intelligence but he's got an NBA ready body you know and he's he's yeah. he's six And he's got these great skills. You know, just shoot a bunch of threes. Go, go to his strength. Go to the basket. Get him in the mid post. Get him at the elbow. And uh, so, uh, he's a, he's a great pickup. I, I I really like him. You know, I like that NBA ready body too because I think he's got that strength and build that you know you never know about injuries and get wear and tear. But it's he's probably more more durable now and ready to take the the banging and the grind. So, I love. I like what I'm seeing. Great to have, you know, this length like Bo Bo, Mo Bamba made strides last year. I thought Wendell, Wendell Carter is so valuable and he's done a great job. And so yeah. they, it's, it's exciting. I think they're going to be, they're definitely on the way up. JT, your guy's on it. Your guy watches the team. He knows the roster. That's impressive. Always prepared, always ready to step in if need be. You know, you need some commentary. Just bring him into the game, get him to talk to people. <laughs> I, I, yeah. You know, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, I just don't have all the salary cap data, so I'm not sure how we can make the you know, <laughs> mid-season trade. Or, I think you can get you that. I can get you that. We can work on that. We can make that happen. 
Does it amaze that. you, Greg? Greg, when you see all these young guys, I mean, think about it. Paolo is 19 years old. You, I mean, you talked about he's got an NBA ready body. Um, you know, just uh, these the guys coming in so young and they are so skilled. It's just really amazing, isn't it? It is. It's, it's you know, it's really kind of changed the last 20, 30 years. You know, the guys, even down in the high school level, I work with these kids in high school and some middle school kids, and they've, you know, they're working with personal trainers and, and uh, uh, they've, they've uh, you know, really uh, worked on a lot of individual skill work. Sometimes we don't see, unfortunately, sometimes we don't see with the basketball system, maybe the, uh, the, the basketball team IQ and, and the skills and working together and playing as a team with some young players. But certainly these guys like Paulo and these other guys are coming in the NBA. They have that or they're learning that, learning to play together and learning to uh, you know play the game as a team. But it's, it is really amazing as, as young as guys are, you know, the, the league has gotten younger and it's great what they've done too. I love it. You know, that, that the uh, G league is like a triple A baseball is now. So you got this alternative and, and, uh, where guys can go and develop and uh, you know maybe they're not the first round number one pick but they could be a you know have a nice long-term NBA career and get a chance to get some minutes uh you know down in the G League and then come on up and help teams. Greg and JT you can comment on this too there was a time did you ever think there was a time last night where we had on the floor Bull Bull, yeah. Mo Bamba, Franz Wagner, Paolo Bancare I mean four guys that are 6'10 or taller all on the floor at the same time. I, back in back in the eighties, that that just would never happen. I, did you ever think you would see something like this, Greg? What do you think? I, 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 I yeah, I, you know, we I think you know length, length and size per position has always been a big thing in NBA. Always wins. You know, you look at you look at Magic Johnson, you look at Clyde Drexler, yeah. you look at uh, the big point guards. You know, I, I play. I went to the Celtics and. Uh, here I'm 6'11", but I've got kind of average length. My wingspan's about seven feet. But I've got Kevin McHale, who's just as tall as me or even a little bit shorter, can reach five inches higher than I can. You know, <laughs> Cedric Maxwell, long arms, Dennis Johnson, Robert Parrish, Bill Walton, on and on. So, you know, when you put that with a uh, – that's the game's not played with the top of your head. You know, it's played with, the, with, with where you reach to. And so being able to get off shots, be able to – to get the rebound, get that extra ball, huge advantage, you know? And uh, so, and have, and now these guys, a lot of them have the mobility and the skill to not only, you know, clog up space, but also to um, to handle the ball on the perimeter, to shoot on the perimeter. And uh, uh, because that's just kind of where the game's gone. Not that, not that uh, guys in the eighties couldn't shoot the heck out of it, but there's just a philosophy was you weren't going to shoot as, you know, as, as many threes and the floor so they've uh, you know they've developed their skills and you know to to meet the, the style of play and, 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 the, and the rules but you know you look back some of the great teams like we played the Rockets in the finals you know the Celtics were big in 86 and the Rockets had Hakeem, Ralph Sampson, Robert Reed, 6'8 of the guard um, you know some other big guys who are guards the perimeter guys were long arms so it's it's a formula that's always won throughout the NBA and so it's awesome to see the magic happen. Well, so Greg, so you've started down the road now. You've been talking about your Celtic teams and everything. So Dante is just itching uh, to talk to you about the Celtics and everything. But you know, you bring up a great point. You think think about your uh, those Celtics teams of the yeah. early '80s. You know, you're throwing out you know Bird and you know McHale and Parrish and you know Danny Ainge was six six four six five right. DJ was six four. You know, they were big right. long teams back then. Absolutely. You know, and you had bigger, stronger guards because, you, you know, you had the, the hand check rule, you know, the, so you could, so a guy like Derek Harper would go up and squeeze a guard's waist and slow him down. You know, you had the, you had the water bug game changer or Spud Webb or something like that, or, you know, coming certainly was effective, but, uh, you know, with the rule changes, what was in the early eighties defensively, where you can't impede a guy's progress. It really opened it up uh, to the guy who could, uh, you know, who's a little bit smaller, jet jet down the floor. But yes, the lineups were big and big and strong overall. All, all, uh, back then, like you said, our, all of our starters were six four, six five, and up, and and many of them with a lot, a lot of, uh, great reach. Greg, so take us back. So nineteen eighty three, right? You're drafted out of BYU. You're going to the Boston Celtics. 
what did you know about the Celtics? What did you, your, your first thoughts as you're introduced to Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish? So draft day, I'm here in Orlando, down at my in-laws house, down in the Conway area. My wife, Jenny, grew up here. Her parents grew up here. So we, we met back in college at BYU. She played on the women's team, and this was uh, we were married by then. And so we were excited to go to Celtics. Her dad was a big Celtics fan. I had grown up in Houston, and I you know, watched uh, uh, Moses say that he could beat them you know, in four games, which worked in, in four four straight with four guys from petersburg and stuff like that but uh, fo, fo, but, uh fo. obviously the celtics were you know hey we're talking we're talking the the dodgers and the yankees you know the the, the, the we're, lakers celtics we're talking the you know the legacy of the nba so i was extremely excited danny was already there Ainge, we'd been teammates for two years so that was a nice plus in college so that was a nice nice plus you know and i get there and, and i played against guys you know in college and he even in high school back in Houston, I'd go to play pickup games with some of the Rockets and the NBA guys. So it wasn't like it was new to play against great talented guys, but I remember sitting there in training camp and kind of pinching myself and going, Hey, you know what? I'm here with Bird and McHale and Paris and, and <laughs> practice every day and go, wow, this is something. And then one of our first exhibition games, we played the Sixers. And uh, you know, it's like between six and seven players out shooting around before the formal team warm-ups and 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 uh Doc comes out, Dr. J comes out, and he says, hi, Greg. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, that's my, my name. <laughs> that's so, awesome. Uh, you know, there was a little bit of that the first year, but I mean, I was so blessed to be on that Celtics team. Quinn Buckner and um, ML Carr were veterans on the bench, and those guys have been in the league for 10 years, have been good players with other teams and even all-stars. And, and, and they told me and the other rookie, Carlos Clark, they said, you know, we're, we're getting to the finals going deep in the playoffs and he said, enjoy this rookie. This doesn't happen very often. Yeah. It was the first time for those guys in their, you know, 10 year plus career. And then I, I was blessed to be there. First four years, we went to the NBA finals, you know, uh, one in 84 and one in 86 and, and lost and being part of that magic bird era. You know, you look at games being, you know, not long before that game in the finals being tape delayed and, and just the NBA exploded with them, you know, tail end of Dr. J and, Kareem's career and then Michael Jordan and, and then Jeff Turner and Greg Kite come along, you know, too. And the NBA just takes <laughs> Change off. Change the game. Change the game. Uh, <laughs> and under That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, and you look at, you look at, uh, you look at where they are now, you know, it's just really, that kind of the year where it took off. And I saw the, um, some uh, 30 for 30 or something about the Celtics and Lakers. And they noted and realized this, that, you know, every year during the eighties, either the Celtics or Lakers or both of them were in NBA finals. So yes. you know, talk about right. the iconic franchises. I think I really think that set the stage for for what we see with the NBA today and the great uh, vision of David Stern with worldwide expansion when they opened up the you know the, the Olympics to professionals instead of amateurs. Ninety two with the Dream Team. So it's an awesome you know worldwide game. And we've got I know Jeff when you and I played, what were there probably ten guys in the league who were international players. You know, now yeah, it's probably, yeah. I guess, 100 or something like that. So it's, it's, 120 it's uh, great this year on opening night game. rosters. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Greg, and, talk about, talk about the. Uh, so much interest. The, yeah. say, talk about the 86 team a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of people felt like that was one of the greatest teams ever assembled. What, what were you guys, 63 and 19 in the regular season? Um the addition of Bill Walton to the that that had to be a, a change in the locker room. Quite an interesting addition. <laughs> it, it was. Bill was Bill was great. Bill's one of my favorite people of all time. If if you love broadcasting, you gotta stay up late and watch those yes. Pac 10 games when Bill <laughs> Bill talks. <laughs> yes. Bill's such a smart guy. He's funny. We had a lot of fun with him, you know, and and uh amazing what he's done with his career. You know, he used to be a he used to stutter a lot and then post career right. he got into where he got took care of that and got into broadcasting. But, you know, uh, when we, we had, obviously the people we talked about earlier, they made the trade with to the Clippers for um, uh, uh, Cedric Maxwell for Bill Walton. And Bill had been in the league about 13 years, but because of his injuries, he played maybe equivalent about four years. And, uh, right. and uh, he had a you know, double digit surgeries over the years on his knees and on yeah. his feet. And even at that, Bill, when he came in, 
I've never been around anybody who had better timing on rebounds than Bill. I mean, he get the ball the second he came off the rim and an incredible passer. And so to add Bill and for him to be healthy there in 86, and we picked up Jerry Seasting, who had been a great a good player in Indiana. I had myself, Sam Vincent, uh, uh, Rick Carlisle, Scott Wedman uh, off the mm -hmm. bench. And so um, uh, we we, uh, we had a lot of fun in those practices. There's a great book Dan Shaughnessy wrote about that era that recently came out. And uh, it's it, it, the title of that book was We Wish It Would Never Have Ended, I think is what he titled it. And uh, we did. But, you know, we had, you know, we had good teams the years before, but I, I have no doubt that that was one of the best teams in NBA history. Maybe other than the preseason team that Jeff and I had in, in September and October when we were really good <laughs> in preseason yeah. practices. That was, but I, I, I kid, but um, <laughs> we, were the, we, we, yeah, were, we, we were the original we Mr. Octobers. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Forget about Reggie Jackson. No. <laughs> we knew when to speak. <laughs> you know, peak, but we only lost one game at home and like you said and one of our goals i've never heard another nba team talk about this uh probably they're out there but one of our goals was never to lose two games in a row and i think we did that the whole regular season i think the last two games or something or two of the last three we lost two in a row but things were rest wrapped up and they were resting some they were letting me play more basically <laughs> oh, come on now. And, uh, come and Sam and David Bird Kill. And so we lost a couple of games at down the end, but then we went to the playoffs and we were rolling through the playoffs. The only series I think we lost to in was against the Rockets. So it was a uh, incredible bunch, one of the best passing teams ever. I need mean, to see clips of that and just a lot of fun to play on, a lot of fun to be a part of. Well, growing up watching that team, that is the greatest team of all time, in my opinion, that 86 Celtics team. And I'll, and I'll, I'll die on that hill. I have no problem with that. <laughs> but, I, you know, you mentioned Dan Shaughnessy, right? So Dan Shaughnessy, he writes that book, and he says how he lost a free throw shooting contest to Larry Bird. Larry Bird wore the money in his sock the entire game that night, right? So you hear, growing up watching you guys, I don't know that we knew that Bird was this trash talker that we hear now. I, you obviously oh, yeah. knew it, right? How much did you hear and what, what are some of the. And how much did you stories? take? How much did you take, Greg? Like, did, were, were you the just the brunt of, of the trash talking during practices sometimes or. No, did, no. Did but, he share the wealth? Well, uh, there's a little bit in practice and stuff, but but, uh, you know, like we, we'd scrimmage in practice. Green team with green was the backups against the white. We'd, 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 we'd keep scoring on the chalkboard in the locker room, you know, how many times we beat them and then. They would cheat and they'd erase it. So they, they <laughs> those guys were tired though during practice, but everybody was very competitive. But no, a lot of give and take, a lot of fun with on the team. But certainly here, Larry talked to other guys, and then you go watch some of these videotapes, you know, like <clears throat> telling guys, you know, uh telling the coach, you know, that hey, you hit a couple of jumpers, hey, you need to call time out. <laughs> or you know, <laughs> you don't <laughs> you don't have anybody over there to guard me or some guys closing out on his jumper, and depending on his size or age, it was either uh, too, as the jumper's going up, it was either too late, too little, too small, you know, <laughs> too slow, too old. And uh, uh, That's great. Larry was awesome. And you know what, though, the trash sucking you did, it wasn't macho bravado, and uh, and uh, Kevin was awesome at it too. Uh, was it was really kind of uh, Kevin used to call it stealing the stealing the other guy's brain waves you know <laughs> they were trying to get in their head a little bit so and i also think sure. larry with larry a little bit it was probably how he got into his mindset in the game you know he's out there playing and he's focused he's got a great uh mental toughness but you know if he could have a little fun and and uh rag the other guy um that was uh that was all for him but there were some there was some you know uh, it, it, not just him, but there was some awesome stuff. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the clip of the 84 series with Cedric Maxwell. Who would do this today? You know, James Worthy misses a free throw in the clutch. Yes. Max, Max walks from one lane slot to the other, doing this, <laughs> you know. <but> he, <laughs> And I was talking to Max before, I mean, talking to Worthy before the free throw. And, and uh, so – you know, no, no uh, malice intended, but it's, it's competition. It's getting, you know, it's a game. It's getting into the, you know, so uh, it's, I mean, in, in baseball, they, 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 they throw yeah. it near your chin or they, or they slide with spikes up, you know, uh, and uh, in, in, uh, in golf, they can't do anything in football. I'm sure there's a lot of guys who talk, but it's the, uh, that's really uh, was, 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 was a lot of, was really a lot of fun. Um, 
And there was even stuff like Cedric Maxwell used to go out and he would, one of his uh, heroes was Dan Roundfield. He, he really admired Dan. And Dan would always have wristbands on or a, or an elbow pad or knee pads. And Cedric was a joker. So Cedric would go out and see what he, what Dan was wearing for accompaniments during uh, pregame warmups. He'd go back in the locker room and match him. All of his injuries. And, uh, uh, that's great all i ever wanted to do in life was do to george what kevin McHale did to kurt Rambis. it's all i ever wanted to do <laughs> oh. hey there's still time, there's still yeah, time. i'm right here you mean right a, com here. a common foul take the ball out of bounds on the sideline <laughs> right Isn't that exactly. amazing? is that what that exactly. was was that, that a common foul? that's all that was and i don't think they weren't even the bonus they just took the ball out of bounds and the guys stayed in the game and uh of course they did uh, <laughs> you know, right now, what would they be suspended for? Oh, oh yeah. a month. They'd be suspended for a month. Uh, Forget it. Fines and jail and jail time. Jail time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that really wasn't Kevin's. Uh, that wasn't Kevin's personality and mo. And yeah. I think I don't think he, Kevin was trying to foul him. I just think with Kurt going full speed this way and Kevin sure. going full speed that way, he just caught him and and you know flipped him almost head over heels and <laughs> kurt got up and was going to kill somebody and uh, he got held back or something but it was uh, uh yeah the, the the stuff that was allowed was definitely different you know <laughs> in those days but that was a serious changer in fact i think it was uh, we lost the game before and the, the lakers looked like they're on the path to you know blow us out and run us out and uh at the gym and next few games and larry got on on people about being yeah. about the rest of the guys on the team being right. sissies in the media. I remember <laughs> and, uh, that. So, I remember uh, that. But, you know, you know, those days with the rules, like, so you play with the rules. The rules are, okay, make a guy shoot free throws. I mean, you still see it with the, the old Hack-A-Shack or Hack-A-Dwight or whoever's a poor free throw shooter a little bit, but it was, hey, make that guy think about it, you know, um, <laughs> or, or don't give him a wide open layup. And sometimes it resulted in, you know, and of course, you didn't want you didn't want your starters, you know, going and doing that in the first quarter. So it was, you know, Greg Kite or Carlos Clark come into the game, and and uh, here, um, Artis Gilmore and, uh, and and George Gervin are killing us. So you know, if they're going up strong, <laughs> take a <laughs> take a foul. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> and it also got the it also got the opposing coach. You know, the the referees are quick to call fouls on the guys that come in off the bench. Uh, because it gets the opposing co the coach off their back, because you know, <laughs> but uh, but definitely, the, yeah, it was uh, that was quite a hit, quite a hit. You know, I think about we with, with this Celtics team, Greg. Did you have any interaction with Bill Russell when, when you were there? Did you have any? Or did you play for him in Sacramento? I, I was trying to remember that as well. What was your interaction like with? with I, I did, yeah. So the year before I uh, joined the Magic, uh, and that's a funny story I'll talk about too, is uh. I almost signed with the Magic was uh, I paid for Sacramento and Bill was the general manager uh, then. So he's the person who offered the contract to us and signed it. But I didn't see Bill a lot then. He was playing golf a lot, I think, that year when, <laughs> when we were in Sacramento. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. was at some of the games and practices. But he was around off and on. He didn't live in Boston, but he was off and around off and on in Boston for activities or just to visit, come see Red and KC and uh, – so, you know, what an incredible person, incredible player, and really talk about, you know, some of the foundations of the NBA and making the Celtics, you know, the the the, the marquee team that they were. Bill was part of that. You know, who's got, who's got, I don't even have enough fingers. Who's got 11 championships, you know? Right. And right. Uh, so he was, he was around, obviously. You know, one of the neat things we got through the Celtics in, in 2016, it was the 30th anniversary of the 86 team, the uh, 86 championship, the 76 championship, and the 66 championship. So they nice. had as many guys that could come up to the last game in the regular season for a couple of days before. And uh, and Bill Russell was there. He'd had a, a stroke or two before that. He was already in a wheelchair. But it, it was there's uh, some amazing pictures that we had of they honored us, recognized us at the game, and you know some guys who have passed since then, like John Havlicek and and Sam right. Jones and Bill Russell and Tommy Heinsohn and JoJo White. So, and you know the most fun thing about that, we had a private dinner a couple nights before, and another time where we got together with the sponsors and just sitting around with those guys and and trading war stories and talking to them <laughs> and hearing it. That was it was incredible and. Uh, so, you know, that was uh, such a great part of that, 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 that Celtic culture was what Red had built and, you know, as a coach and as general manager and then, 
Mint Bill and a lot of those former Celtic guys were around or dropped in. That's great. That's great. That's great. Uh, let's pivot to your Orlando tenure, Greg. Uh, you spent four years in Orlando uh, from 90 to 94. Was Orlando on your radar when the expansion team came on board in 89? Because you said your wife was from the Orlando area. Was that something mm -hmm. that that you had wanted to do as as your career was was kind of coming on the on the tail end? Absolutely. So, I, you know, after the Celtics, I got shipped out to the L.A. Clippers and, and uh, you talk about the top of the ladder to the bottom ladder as far as team it was a great opportunity for me because i got to play more a lot start some and play a lot of minutes and developed uh there's a player probably more established my value as a backup center so it was about then about uh 88 or so when it was 87 when they first announced the franchise and we would come to orlando and spend uh part of the, you know the summer um, when it wasn't working out or going to the summer league here in orlando and Jenny and the kids would stay here, and we, we said, "Hey, you know the Magic Eight are coming." And uh, it was first year '89, and what a great, you know, they it'd be awesome to play for them sometime. And then um, after the Clippers and a brief stint with the Hornets, I was a uh, I was a free agent, and I actually didn't sign with anybody during um, before the season and training camp went on. And then uh, uh, Dave Corzine hurt his knee. The first game or two mm -hmm. went down, and then Terry Catledge um, had a, a, a broken thumb, I believe it was. And so Pat Williams uh, 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 called up my agent and, and talked to me. He said, "Hey, we want to sign you. The team's out in Golden State. Uh, this is near Thanksgiving by that time, so they're out in Golden State. They're playing Sacramento a day or two later. So we want you to jump on an airplane." And go a fly out there, you'll get a physical out there, then you'll sign with, you know, we'll get the contract done. And uh, and so I was excited. Hey, I'm gonna play for the magic. This is the first year, 89, 90, and, and get to be, you know, a teammate with Jeff and Reggie Tius and all the guys who are on the team then. And uh, so about a and two hours later, I'm getting ready, packing, going to the airport, and Pat calls back and said, Hey, I'm sorry to tell you, but uh, they had Cat Catledge's thumb reevaluated. He's going to be back in three or four weeks. And, you know, we love you, but the, the owners really don't want to, you know, and the team doesn't want to spend any more money right now signing anybody else. So we're, we're going to have to, you know, negate the deal. And so, and less, and we, and we'd been in touch with Sacramento. Sacramento was looking for a backup center. And so less than an hour later, we had a call through my agent, Bill Russell. They want to sign me. <laughs> so I get back on a, I, I, I don't unpack my bags and I'm on my way to Sacramento and I get there and I get there whenever, whatever the day was, the day before the game or the day of the game. And I have a physical, and this is before cell phones and widespread email. And so I'm sitting there on the, uh, on the, and, and, you know, not on the bench, but in, in, in the stands, like first row of the game, watching the Magic play the, the Kings. And uh, Matt, Matt Gukas, and um, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the assistant coach, um, uh, um, Brian Hill, or Brian Hill, would, and um, probably would have been Bobby Weiss, probably that would Bobby Weiss, 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 yeah, yeah. So, Bobby yeah. Weiss, they're, they're thinking I'm there to come and join them and sign, sign with them. <laughs> the word had gotten out a little bit to the media, so somebody from the media asked me, you know, well, uh, are you here to sign with the, the Magic or the Kings? And, and I, I said, well. I'm going to see who's ahead at halftime and then sign with them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, that wasn't an option. But let's just say the Kings were ahead by one. And so I signed with the Kings and played again the next year. And uh, <laughs> I got to play with Danny again for Danny Angels out there. That's and right. Kenny yes. Smith That's and right. Raymond Tisdale and, and Rodney McRae and, and uh, uh, Jerry Reynolds. Not that Jerry Reynolds played for the Magic, was our coach and for a little while, then Dick Mata. Anyway, had a good year. You know, kind of helped me improve again, reestablish my value. Then the next year, the next summer, that the Magic had um, offered me a, a contract as a free agent, so I was able to sign the first year as, with the Magic. Came on and joined Jeff and Scott Skiles and and Dennis and Nick and and uh, uh, um, Otis Smith, Jerry Reynolds, those guys, Cat Lich. Uh, we really kind of had a lot of fun, and we really. Jeff, you remember we kind of gelled about December or so, and, and we were pretty yeah. darn competitive. You know, I remember going on the road for a second year team and won back to back games and against uh, really uh, playoff teams, Phoenix and, and Golden State, and one stretch. And uh, I think we won a 
about 34, 35 games. And then, uh, and so was able to resign in with the Magic for four years. And uh, after that, and, uh, um, you know, started all 82 games that first year. And then we started, they, we got a couple other big guys, started a lot of the games, but we had a bunch of injuries the next year. I remember one game, we had like seven guys and they'd bring in Chris Cortiani and Stevie Thompson from the CBA, <laughs> just to have enough to meet the limit. And uh, yeah. anyway, we ended up winning, we ended up winning just enough games to get Shaq. Okay. So then Shaq <laughs> comes my third year and they give him my they give him my starting job, and they've never given me an explanation why. Uh, <laughs> you, you demand a reason? <laughs> anyway, you no, should, they, no, they should have explained that to you. That's all. No reason. So can you guys check with uh, – can you guys check with Alex or some of the guys up there but see what, <laughs> yes. what the deal was? So, uh, that's okay. Uh, I've got that's over. great. I've got over. He turned out to be okay. He turned out to be not too bad. So, I mean, we, bad. And Jeff will remember, we're playing in the summer, you know. I don't know we worked out with Shaq, but I remember sitting around with Maddie, and Maddie's going – that uh, Gukas is going, man, Shaq is, they'd seen him at LSU and seen him play in person. And, and Shaq is going, he's going, the closest thing I can compare him to is Wilt Chamberlain. Matt, Maddie had played with Wilt when Maddie was a rookie and Wilt was about 27, 28. You know, so yeah. as far as a guy who's so big and, and powerful. And uh, I recall even, I think it was when I was in Sacramento the year or two before, we had played a game in San Antonio and at halftime, they honored the, the 4A state champion, San, San Antonio Cole High School. And there's this kid out there who's as big as all the NBA guys. And it was Shaq. That was the first time I saw him. But what an incredible, you know, difference he made. And then and then we're playing, remember playing in the summer, uh, Jeff, and before the draft, and Penny Hardaway comes back for the second time, yeah. you know, second visit. And we scrimmage together over this uh, church gym over uh, uh, off of uh, Mills. And uh, we're going like, wow, you know, this is this is part two. If they if they get him, and then you know, then the whole story was, you know, the Chris Weber for uh, Penny right. Trade. What a you know, what an incredible you know infusion of talent. And talk about climbing the ladder, you know, rapidly and fast. So so then I go and do the dumb thing that first year Penny has, and I do I do the Wally Pip thing. You know, the Wally Pip story where yeah, he's sick yeah. and gets hurt and Lou Gehrig yeah, comes into right. place. I'm in a great position. I'm in my, you know, my early 30s, mid 30s, and I'm and I back up and play behind Shaq for 10 minutes a game. And, and the team's getting better. And and once in a while, they'll let Jeff and I run a four or five pick and roll when during garbage yeah. time. And and uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, then I go get hurt in, uh, in January. I hurt my Achilles of that second year and, and uh, really never played. Got healthy during the summer, but never played for the Magic again. But it's, I've loved it, loved it being here. Love to, you know, see what they did during that era. And uh, you know, I'm a, I've been here around Orlando for about 40 years now, so the Magic and Orlando are in my blood. So I'm excited to see what's what's going on now with this new young team. You know, it's crazy, Greg. That's you great, know, you Greg. just I, like you just you know put this, you bring back so many memories talking yes. about those times and everything. But for the people that are that are listening to this podcast and just like being around Orlando and uh, becoming a major league, you know, a, a, a franchise, you know, a city really when the magic came to town. I don't think, you know, people really can appreciate the energy in the old Amway arena. Um, you know, the, those early years, it was packed. It was so much fun. It was an event that everybody wanted to be a part of. Even though we, you know, you mentioned that second year, we had it rolling a little bit. It was exciting. But even through wins and losses, um, it, it was really a great environment to play in, wasn't it? It was, you know, and it, it was a great environment. It was a thing to do in town. It was a happening thing. And then, you know, then as we took off with Shaq and Penny joining the team, it was just, it was awesome. And, and uh, I know they had the era with Dwight and, and – and Stan Van Gundy and 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 uh, getting to the finals back then and uh, nice thing, but hopefully we could recapture that in Orlando because it was a great uh, you know Bear Bryant had a great a great quote that I always love. He said, you know, nobody ever rallied around a math class. You know, talking about <laughs> talking about you know colleges that uh, you know you don't get excited about what's going on academically, but you get excited right. about the football team and so. What what can a city rally around other than a, you know and that's a something like the Magic, a, a yep. successful competitive sports team, you know. So it can be a great thing to bring people together. I mean, I ran basketball camps for years and and here, uh, 
back in the 80s 90s and you know when it was playing for the magic it was like you know kids were coming out of you know the droves to something you know to sign up and everybody had a you know so hopefully we can get that energy and excitement back but it was a great time jeff and and that was a great place to play and and uh i was ha very happy to be a part of that hey la last thing greg and I, and I think it'd be interesting for magic fans to know what you're up to now kind of get us all caught up i you know, George knows, Jeff knows, I know. Anything, anytime we've ever asked anything of you, you've delivered. I mean, you're that kind of guy. You you mean a lot to this community. You've given back an incredible amount. And I, I don't know how many people know all the things that you're doing here in Central Florida. And I, and I think you should take the platform to to do that and, and just know how much we all appreciate everything you've done here in Central Absolutely. Florida. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll try to, try to keep it brief. But uh, first of all, and first and most important thing is just family uh, we have an awesome family wonderful family like i said we've got deep florida roots uh we have a big family jenny who's 510 was college basketball player told me she wanted a big family i thought she meant power forwards tight ends volleyball <laughs> players and supermodels now i have some daughters that look like supermodels but we ended up with 10 kids and uh oh, wow. <laughs> that's amazing uh, uh we were i got we're two, two kids and i have no idea what they're doing at any time <laughs> yes and, and you have no brain cells they start to deplete so we're, we're empty nesters now so we're in recovery as far as the brain cells but uh you know a lot of people said oh we're going to be like you like pat williams well we actually did all of our children were adopted as infants just kind of the way oh. that it worked out for our family. God worked the way God brought our children to our family. And now we have 19 grandkids going on Amazing. 20. And uh, the grandkids are a lot cheaper. So that's a good uh, advice to give to you. <laughs> but uh, it also kind of led me to a couple of things that I'm doing. Uh, one uh, one thing back in the, the days when I was playing with the Magic, my wife Jenny had been, had been involved in early childhood education and saw a need for some children including a couple of ours just kind of falling through the gaps and wanted to start a private school and so we founded back in 1996 uh, pathways uh private school it's down in the uh, oak ridge area we have a nonprofit organization the gift of learning foundation runs it's been going on for 27 years they added high school grades a few years ago so i helped them get um, high school sports started there and now it's kind of uh, I, I was actually the uh, athletic director for a while but she fired me my wife fired me and her, her brother and retired what? from college coaching, which was good. Job. I didn't have time to do all the schedule, all that. So now I can, I stay involved by helping the high school team. You know, I'm an assistant coach. I can get to most of the games, but uh, full That's time, awesome. uh, what I do, I'm in the financial business. I'm with Poly Wealth Management. We're, um, I'm, uh, I'm a uh, senior senior wealth advisor there. We, we do uh, wealth planning, financial planning. We do a uh, manage investments and assets for people would be a holistic approach to people's, uh, um, you know, uh, um, financial affairs, life, life focused. And part of what stirred me on with that, I would love to have stayed involved in basketball. And I do, you know, I would have loved to have been involved in college or pro basketball. I did coach for a while, but I had moved around so much. Jenny wasn't moving anymore. So, you know, <laughs> the coaching modern stuff kind of takes to different places. So I did coach junior college here for a number of years back when Seminole, uh, state had, uh, uh, basketball, but um, um, I always stay involved in basketball, but also what I saw uh, and I actually started to get licensed and do an internship when I was playing back in Boston was I love helping people and be kind of being a money coach. And also I saw, Hey, we got these 10 kids. I'm going, man, this NBA career is going to end. And I got to, we're going to have all these kids in college. We had five kids in college at, at one point. And I'm going, oh, how are we going to pay for this? So, <laughs> still retire. So <laughs> That's part of kind of what spurred me on to, uh, among other things, I got uh, uh, you know licensed and uh, gained a lot of experience about 16 years ago. So uh, I spent full time doing that. So in fact, we got a tonight we got a little seminar for educational workshop over at Wednesday College in, in Winter Park, uh, teaching people about you know some of the ups and downs of retirement and planning for retirement. So. I love that. I think it's a I think it's a great story. How how can people help with Pathway School? Is there things that people can do to get involved or contribute, or what are some ways the community can can kind of help out with that? Um, sure. Like I said, we have a um, uh, you know, a nonprofit that runs it called the Gift of Learning Foundation. Certainly, people could donate. Uh, they may be there may be opportunities for people to uh, volunteer or mentor people. You know, so people in the community maybe a guest guest speaker. Um, we. Uh, uh, we have it, you know, they're so busy doing what they do to run the business and sometimes they don't have to 
and to take care of all the kids that don't have time. So if anybody would like to reach out and go to their website, it's uh, Pathways. I should know the website, but you could Google it, pathwaysprivateschool.org, and they can look up and reach out and contact the school. Excellent. Excellent. Good stuff, Greg. I appreciate it. We could do this for another hour, but uh, I really appreciate you taking time to do this and let us know when to come out to a game. And we got we want to see that golf yeah. game. I'm sure that I'm sure that golf game is on point. Oh. Not as good as not as good as JT, but I'm sure it's on point. It's gotten uglier and uglier. So yeah, so I, uh, I think I set the record at Aliqua. Scott Skiles said for losing golf balls. So uh, but yeah, I'd love to play. Right? I was there. To golf. I was golf there. Golf. So, yeah, we can, we can go to Top Golf sometime and we, that way we can have some chicken wings while we while we hit a target. Yes, so yes, and the next show is an hour. Yeah. The next show is it, JT. The next time we catch up with Greg, can we do an hour on your guy Scott Skiles? Can we do an hour on that? We could do that. Oh. There's a lot of Scott Skiles stories. I got one one real quick question, real quick comment or story, real quick. Yes, yes. yes. So you know, in today's NBA game, you know, the one of the big things is you know people are fascinated with and players have mastered the step back, right? The step back yeah. three or whatever that was. Listen, when Greg Kite was playing <laughs> basketball, he had already mastered the step back, right? Oh, okay. And, but Greg, you know. In that Boston Celtic Larry Bird tradition, he had what he would call the step back, patty whack, give a dog a bone. Right? Like, <laughs> it wasn't from three points. It was from the elbow, the step back. And he would let you know as soon as he released it that he was giving you the bone. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Ah, that's cool. Yes, indeed. G was the shame of the trash talk. And, uh, yeah, we had fun. So, you know, the only thing that held me back, you know, was was uh, the guy over on the sideline with the, the tie on, the coach, you know. So it's like the old story. You know, who, who's, the, who's the only person to hold Michael Jordan under 20 a game? Dean Smith. You know, Jordan yes. averaged 19.8 or something, North Carolina. But, but no, yeah, it was a fun move. I'd love to do it. Uh, yeah. And uh, actually kind of did learn it from some of the guys in Boston. They learned it from Terry Durod. And then Kiki Vandewey used to have a really good one, so – Spent yeah. a lot of time with Kiki with, uh, uh, at, uh, anyway, it was a, it was a, <laughs> uh, it's a fun move. Great move. That's and awesome. some guys do the ball these days. They got, they got step back patty whack plus more. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. All right, Greg, we appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you soon. That'll do it for this edition of Magic Pots Club.